As you know, we are busy with our journey through the book of Revelation. Uh, let me remind you that we started uh, the first evening, uh, introduction and structure of the book of Revelation and the glorified Christ, the Son of Man. That was Revelation chapter 1. Are you with me? Revelation chapter 1, the structure of the book, introduction to the book, and then we looked at the glorified Son of Man. And last week we looked at um, number 2, which was the Christ and the church, Revelation chapter 2, speaking of the four churches. Now, we're looking at Revelation chapter 3, and if you would like to read with me, we will start with the church of Sardis, and then we will go to the church of Philadelphia, and then the Laodicean church. Now, so let's read together. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, the third, uh, this, uh, in, in chapter 3, the second church the faithful church, the brotherly love church, we read of this church, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things, says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to, preserve, to uh, persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And lastly, the lukewarm church, the materialistic church. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire 
that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let me recap for you. Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 deals with the things that are. In other words, what is now. If I take you back to the time frame, when we look here to the prophetic timeline, after Jesus went to heaven, the church had start, and so we know we are here at the last church before the rapture. In other words, when we read Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, we are looking at the whole church age. And the three last, uh, last churches take us to the end of the church age. In other words, if I would ask you tonight, where would the church of Laodicea be placed on this timetable? Where would you say the church is? Of course, it would be right here at the end of the church era, which means that the church will end with a rapture. Bear in mind, when we get to the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the dream that he had of all the kingdoms, I want you to remember that what we know here is that this period, the last week, the seven-year tribulation is still to come, and it can only take place after the rapture. But before that, we have the church age. In other words, from Christ, risen from the dead, went to heaven, we have the church age in this period. So we have two images. The one will show the mystery of the church on this image, and then we can see the church on this image. When we look at the church in this image, we know that the church of Jesus Christ will now over a period of 2,000 years, in 10 years' time, the church will have its 2,000-year birthday in 2030. Now, so we know this period of time, the church will play out. And this is the time frame that we are in tonight. Looking at the church in Revelation chapter 3, the church in Sardis, the church in Sardis, as all the other churches, there's a word from the Lord that each letter commends with, these are the words of Him. And then we have a description of the glorified Christ in Revelation chapter 1. You need to remember that every one of the seven churches sees something of the glorified Christ. And that tells something about Him in His message to the church. The other thing, is, um, and he says, I know your deeds. And that is said to every church. Every church, I know your works, I know your deeds. So every letter also concludes with the words, to him who has overcome, to him who overcomes, and he who has an ear, let him hear. So the seven churches, Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3, play out in the church era. Bear in mind that after Revelation chapter 3, you never read of the church ever again in the book of Revelation. You need to understand. Never again you read the word church in the book of Revelation after Revelation chapter 3. But the character of the book of Revelation changes to Israel because then we will read a lot about Revelation chapter 7 of the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 4 and 5, we read of the Lamb of God in heaven. And we come to understand that the character of the book of Revelation changes. Why? There can only be one reason. And that is that the church 
after Revelation chapter 3 is not on earth anymore, but that the church, the harvest has been brought in and the church will be taken away back to heaven in the rapture. So clearly, because of that, there will be then a time frame period of the seven year tribulation, which means from Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 19, we see uh, all the things that will play out in that seven year tribulation. To explain this in another way, I need to bring you back. Look again, that when the church era comes to an end, the rapture takes place, when the rapture takes place, we still have this era that's left. But that era is to do with the nation of Israel. And it's all about this country, Israel, Jerusalem, where Jesus died, where he gave his life. And this is also the middle of the earth. And so what we will see as we proceed in Revelation, we will look at all the kingdoms that will become um, uh, a big part uh, in the end time as we see it here in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. So for now, let's finish off the church era by looking firstly to the church of Sardis. And when you look at verse 1, it says, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So the description of the Lord Jesus Christ here, a message from him is, yes, he has the seven spirits, but also he holds the seven stars in his right hand. So by saying that I am in charge of my church, but I know your works and I can see what is going on in this church. And the fact that he has the seven stars in his hand and the fact that he's speaking to the Sardis church, which is actually the spiritually dead church, means that Sardis as having a reputation of being alive, but was dead. And that was in no way a flattering description of that church. To hear that you are a spiritually dead church. You see, Sardis was located here in Turkey, in, in Asia Minor. And the church that John was addressed, the letter to, by way of the angel and the Lord Jesus that told him to write to the church, the message to this church in the day of John, and it would also transpire in prophetically in the time to come, in the ages to come, to, uh, about the church of Jesus Christ. The letter was written to this old city, which existed actually a thousand years before Jesus Christ. This church was built. And it was a very uh, affluent city, uh, the old section was built on a mountain. The new section was built in a valley. But here's an interesting thing. Have you ever studied the name Sardis to know what it comes to mean? It means a remnant that had broken away. That is what the name means. So this church is having a reputation. Yeah, they are alive. But the Lord says, you are a dead church. They, they were without spiritual power. So the appearance of Jesus as one of the seven spirits says, where is the spirit in the church? Where's the spirit of the Lord? Because the local church had no spirituality or spiritual dedication to the Lord. That is why in Jesus' appearance to the church, he says he is the one that had the seven spirits. And they lacked the distinction of being filled with the spirit of God. And therefore, we talk about Sardis as a spiritually dead church. And I will make some, uh, uh, some remarks about that in the next few minutes. The seven stars in his right hand refers to the angels, the messengers uh, of the various churches. So the general description of this church was that they had a good reputation outwardly, but inwardly they were spiritually dead. So from the outside, everything looks good. But in the inside, Jesus said, I can see that the spirit lack in this church. And so the, the admonition of Jesus is recorded. The church members were instructed to awake and to strengthen those that remain alive. So the church had to return to their previous condition of spiritual living and adhering to the word of God. And now Jesus warns them that his return would find them unprepared and would overcome them like a thief. 
He's warning them. He says that if I come and I found your works not perfect before God, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. So Jesus is asking his church to prepare and be ready for him. So the impression that was dominant about this church, the church of Sardis, was that the church in Sardis did not share their testimony in the city of Sardis. They had no testimony to the people in the city as it should be that the church is a light to the world and share the gospel. So this, this church lived only for itself. And in verse 4, the Lord Jesus commended those uh, whose clothes had not been soiled. And in a prophetic sense, in the church as, as pertaining to Sardis, we find that, um, yes, uh, the church starts changing in the days of Martin Luther and come and some of his contemporaries, they held firm to the word of God as to the only rule of faith and life. And when you look at the Sardis period in church history in the Middle Ages, it, we could really see how the Roman church represented the church of the Lord, but misled the Christian world with its rituals and its formalism and with its high and mighty Latin language. And the ordinary people, they couldn't understand what was said. And it was the same Martin Luther that translated the Bible so that the common people could read the Bible in their own language. That brought the Reformation. If you can't read the Bible in your own language, how could you understand? If there's no language that you can read the Bible in that you can speak, how can you understand the word of God? Hence, Luther went to the church at Wittenberg in Germany and he published his famous 95 core doctrines by nailing it to the main entrance, the door of the church. And that happened on the 31st of August, 1517. And because of that, he was excommunicated and declared to be a heretic. He was chucked out of the church, and they said that he was an heretic. And his simple answer was, sola scriptura, which means the word and the word only. Only the word of God. That was his answer to the formalistic church of Sardis. So in verse 5 and 6, we see the promise of Jesus to this church. And there's a few things that we can clearly see, at least three promises of Jesus to the church in Sardis. Firstly, there was a promise uh, of Jesus that those who would be found worthy would walk with him in white clothes. According to Revelation 7 verse 14, white clothes referred to salvation. And also in Revelation 19 verse 8, it speaks of righteous deeds. In other words, if you are clothed with white clothes, it means not only you are saved, but you live a holy, pure, righteous life in the eyes of God, and that is what you will receive when you get to heaven one day. And the second thing that Jesus said, then their names would not be removed. He says, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. So there's a promise here that your name will never be blot out of my book. It's very interesting that in the, uh, the latter part of the book of Revelation, in verse uh, chapter 21, we read of the book of the Lamb as the book of life belongs to the Lamb because of his blood that he shed for us so that our name can be in his book. So the book of the Lamb contains the, name, uh, the names of all those that are saved by Jesus Christ the Lamb of God. And then thirdly, there's a third promise to Sardis, and that is that the faithful ones who would overcome would be mentioned in heaven before his heavenly Father and his holy angels. It's amazing that Jesus says that if you are faithful and you overcome and you confess me in public, in heaven I will confess you before my Father and before his holy angels. What a wonderful promise from our Lord Jesus. What he is saying is, if you confess me here on earth, I am prepared to confess you in the third heaven, in the highest heaven where my Father lives and his holy angels. Your testimony here becomes a testimony in heaven. 
If we testify on earth, if we are faithful here, what happens here has bearing on what happens in heaven. Just think for a moment that if you are faithful here, you serve God and you live out your testimony, your name will be mentioned in heaven, in the courts of heaven, not only to the heavenly Father, but also to His holy angels. And you can understand what it means. What it means is, if that is true, then it means that your name goes before you. It means that the new Jerusalem, which is at this very, very moment located in third heaven, that your father that's in third heaven, in the new Jerusalem, and the holy angels, they know about you even before you arrive there. It means that one day, either uh, through the rapture, or if we die before the rapture take place, when we get to heaven, there will be angels that know our name. You will be surprised when, we, when you walk down the streets of heaven, an angel will look at you and says, hey, look who's here. You have arrived and I know you. And you will say, I don't know you. And he will say, yes. Jesus confessed you before the Father and he confessed you before us. We know about you. You are most welcome. Welcome home, child. You are in heaven. It's an amazing thing. And you will be clothed with white garments. And you will be assured that your name is in the book of life. Now to be sure that this will happen to us, the word of the Lord is to him who overcomes. He who has an ear, verse 6, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the Spirit of God speaking to you and me. It is a promise from the Lord. And then we get to the church of Philadelphia in verse 7, the faithful church, the brotherly love that we see in this church. It's amazing. Because again, the letter will start, um, these things says he who is holy and who is true and who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So the description of the Lord in introducing himself or in his introduction of himself to the church also goes back to Revelation chapter 1. Because in Revelation chapter 1, the glorified Christ said to John, I have the keys of death and Hades in, in his hand. Thus, he has the authority and the power to open and shut doors. Jesus has the key. Now, here is Hades. And what Jesus is saying I have the keys of Hades in the belly of the earth. I decide we will go there. And I decide we will go to paradise, which is now in third heaven, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Because paradise was here, and there was a great gulf between paradise and Hades before the crucifixion of Jesus. But after Jesus rose from the dead, paradise has been moved and everybody into third heaven as we see rightly in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2 to 4. So what Jesus is saying, I have a place for you in paradise and I have the keys of Hades, which means I decide we will go there and we will not go there. The devil does not have the key. He can't make the decision. So this is comforting to us to know that we will not go to hell. You will also see when we get to Revelation chapter 20 that the Lord says he will cast people into the lake of fire. So the Lord has the key to that. He has the key here and he says, I open, I shut. And when we come to the abyss, we read that there's an angel that receives a key in Revelation 20 and he opens and he closes. So these places, these keys that can open and close. And Jesus says, you know me, I know you. You trust me and I love you and I have the key. I decide where you will go. And as his children, we know that he's waiting for us in third heaven, as Paul explained to us so rightly in his writings. So now he says, and this is what we see when we look at this, that this church, Philadelphia, which was also located in Asia Minor, by the way, uh, Philadelphia was also in this area, known today as modern Turkey. We know it today as modern Turkey. So uh, Philadelphia was also located there, and it was southeast of Sardis, built in the second century before Christ. This is a very small church, but very energetic, 
And the name meant, Philadelphia means brotherly love. And the Lord says, I can see that you love each other in this church. There is love. And so the Lord, he says, I know your works. I see the love. He says, and I see, and, and I have set before you an open door. I know that you have little strength, but you have kept my name. And you have not denied my name. So to this church of brotherly love, the Lord says, I have the keys. But what is amazing here, when he tells them that he has the keys, he says, I also have the key of David. Now, this is very interesting. Because the fact that Jesus here says, I, he who has the key of David. Very, very important. Because when we go back to the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 20, you will read, the key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut. And he shall shut and no one shall open. That key of the, belongs to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So the key of the kingdom rule of authority of kingship, of, and it implies royal authority and rule belongs to Jesus. And so he comes to this church of brotherly love and he says to his church of brotherly love, I have given to you an open door. In New Testament, it means that they will have the opportunity of ministry. If the Lord says, I give before you an open door, it means I give you a ministry opportunity. So what the Lord Jesus is saying to the church of Philadelphia, he's, he has afforded them a tremendous opportunity to minister in his name. What is wonderful, if there's love, there's opportunity to minister to this church, that there's brotherly love. So they, they not minister only to themselves and to each other, but there's a ministry opportunity, open doors in that city. So they had to be aware of the fact that they were not dependent on large numbers or power because he says, I know that you have little strength. It's not about how strong the church is. It is not about how many people is in the church to exercise their ministry, but rather to in obedience, um, listen to the call of God and live out the call of God because of the opportunity, the ministry opportunity, because of uh, that being afforded the opportunity to minister in the kingdom of God. And a church that has love, the Lord says, I will give you this opportunity. And it was also recommended that they should avail themselves of the, of the opportunity afforded to them to honor the name of Jesus. He says uh, very clearly, he also said to them that you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. So they use the opportunity to spread the word of God and not deny the name of Jesus. Now in church history, we know that this church um, filled the period from the 1800s to the 1900 prophetically. And this is the time that we had the most wonderful revivals in world history. Uh, so during this period of time, the Christian church experienced extraordinary revivals. There was not a single place on earth where evangelists and missionaries were not welcome. I mean, this is a time of William Carey, John and Charles Wesley, George Whitefield, William Booth, Swindle, Charles Spurgeon, and many others. And now the Lord says to this church, in verse 9 and verse 10, that I have a promise for you because of who you are and I will keep you uh, from the trials of the great tribulation. And he says, I will not allow you to go into the great tribulation. Christ assured the church that he himself will deal with the enemies of the church and he would safeguard his church. And in verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Does this mean that the Christian can lose his crown? Why is there a warning? Hold fast, that you may not lose your crown. In verse 12, he who overcomes 
And here is a promise. I will make him firstly a pillar in the temple of God, which means you will stand tall in God's temple one day. In glory, you will be a strong, bold pillar in the temple of God. And also, because standing in the temple of God as a pillar means you will have and share the glory of God in His presence. But now, there's three names promised to those who overcome. Firstly, I will write on him the name of my God. Why? Because in the next few chapters, we will read of the Antichrist that will write triple six on people. And God says to his own, I will write on him the name of my God. Not the name of the Antichrist, of the Antichrist, but my, the name of my God. Secondly, the name of the city of my God. This is, this is wonderful. It means that every true believer in this church, in the church of Jesus Christ, they will receive the name of the new Jerusalem written on them because it belongs to you. Not only do we have the name of God in heaven on us, but the city of God, the new Jerusalem that is in heaven, we also will have the name of the new Jerusalem written on us as believers. And then thirdly, and my new name. I will write on him my new name. And this is a wonderful thing that we will one day discover. And now we come to the last church, the lukewarm church. We can also say the materialistic church. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says, and be careful to notice who's speaking now. Again, the glorified Christ, what we've seen in chapter 1. But look at what's been said here. The, these things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So something very definite has been said here. Firstly, it describes the Lord Jesus as the faithful witness. So while the local church of Laodicea is not living out their testimony, because let me remind you that the name Laodicea, uh, the name itself, Laodicea, means the rights of people. Let me first say this. So it speaks of the rights of people. So the local church was more affluent than the other six churches ever mentioned. And Laodicea was known for its banking system, the production of wool, it was a medical school, and there was also a, 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 a manufacturing of salt for the eyes. And so we see here a wealthy church, but the problem of this church was there was no water in the city. And the water that would come would come from a natural source of hot water, uh, but by the time the hot water eventually reached the city, it has already turned cold, so it actually was lukewarm. And people wouldn't like the taste of the water. And now Jesus says, I am a witness to this church. And I can see what is going on in this church that is run by people and not by my spirit. Because he says, I am the faithful witness while I cannot say the same of you. This church was not faithful to him or to the word of God. The reference I am the amen confirms that what he said was true. He refers to himself as an amen. Now, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 65 and 16, it is a term for the name of God. So God says, it is true. He says, I can see what is going on here. I'm speaking the truth, and I know what is going on in my church. That he is the faithful witness. His testimony is true to the facts. And the reference to him as being of the creation of God points to him as the source of all things. As we see in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. So everything that's created was created by him. And now he says, I know your works. And now he reprimands them. He says, I can see that you are lukewarm. Now, being lukewarm means that there's a problem 
Because warm refers to born again Christians in the church. Cold means there are people that aren't saved. So by identifying that this aspect of Laodicea was there were those who claimed to believe in Jesus, but they were never born again. And Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth. And now in verse 17, what is said here, because you say I am rich, I'm wealthy, I have no need of anything, I need nothing. Now, here is the problem. Jesus says, this is self-deception because I pity you in a spiritual sense. You are wretched, you are miserable, you are poor, you are blind, you are naked. Now, what has been said here is not flattering the church because this is a, this is a very hard thing to say. Because what Jesus is saying to the last church, to the Laodicean church, and what is terrible is this is the state of the face of the church of Jesus Christ in the world right before the rapture. This is the description of the last church. And the description of the last church is a church that says that we are rich, and Jesus says, no, you're not. It is a church that says, we don't need anything. And now Jesus says, it is not true. I can see what is going on here. Because you see, prophetically, the church of Laodicea, speaking also of the last church uh, in the 20th and the 21st century, it indicates the last and final chapter of the church of Jesus Christ in the world before the coming of Jesus. The word that's been used here is vox populi, vox dei, which means the voice, the opinion of man has become the voice of God. We need to understand, people do not listen to what God says, but they adhere to what man says. This is the call of democracy, where the will of the majority is more important than the will of God, or what the word has to say. So, what is amazing to me is living in the last days before the rapture, before the second coming of Christ. I can clearly see what is happening. What is in the world is now influencing the church. So democracy has come into the church. The voice of people overpowers the word of God. Because it is not what the Lord says anymore, but it's what people want. In other words, the will of the people becomes stronger than the will of God. It speaks of gold, white cloth. It speaks of salt for ointment. And especially it states that in this church there was a lack of spirituality. Jesus says, you lack gold and you, you lack white linen and also salt for ointment for your eyes. In other words, I can see that there's not holiness and righteousness as it should be. But come to me and I will give you I counsel you, verse 18, to buy from me gold, white garments, and anoint your eyes. In other words, there's an invitation from Jesus to this church. And so what he's asking them is, if you would only repent because of the condition of your heart. So here's the point. The sad state of affairs was that Jesus was standing outside the door of the church. Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. It's terrible. Jesus is outside the church. He's not inside the church. People inside, they're having church, but Jesus is not with them. He's outside the church. This is a sad state of affairs. And he's waiting for an invitation to come in. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. So church members, they were ignorant of what their true spiritual condition was. They could not even see or understand that Christ was standing outside the door. He was waiting for them to open the door. Why? Because human government in the church has misled the church. There was no guidance to find Christ and allow him entrance. He was looking for fellowship with them. Those who were willing to open the door and invite him would enjoy fellowship with him. So Jesus says, he says, I will come in. If anybody hears my voice, anyone, and opens the door, I will come into him, dine with him, and he with me. He can have fellowship with me if he would only open up the door. And so the church, he will speak to them individually. 
that if there's any individuals in the church hearing the Lord's voice and open up their hearts, he would come and fellowship with them. If he could find someone willing to hear and to listen. So here we have it that the letter to the church in Laodicea ends as all the other letters at the end of the church age. And it has to do with a promise. And the promise was in verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So the promise was that those who would overcome the spiritual decay and a backslidden condition, those would uh, overcome uh, the worldly attractions and the worldly mindedness. Um, they would receive the right to sit with Christ on his throne in his kingdom. This is how the church ends. It's terrible to think that Paul in uh, 2 Timothy explained to us um, of the darkness and the evil that will be in the last days in the world. So it's amazing to think that there was a time when it, there was revival in the church worldwide, when the church was growing strong, evangelism was strong, but it, uh, it's heartbreaking to find in the word of God that the last church, the Laodicean church, is in a bad state where there's no spirituality and uh, where there's no true uh, closeness to the Lord and where Jesus is actually outside the door of the church. It's terrible to think that in many, many churches today in the world, Jesus is not welcome inside the church. And the reason for him not being welcome into the church is because of what's going on normally in the leadership of the church, where there's human government, where there's democracy, the spirit of democracy reign, and there's no brotherly love. And so because of that, and, 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 the, and the worldliness that has come into the church, because this is a materialistic church, it is a lukewarm church, because of that, that we find that uh, the situation of the church of Jesus Christ will not be good when Jesus comes to fetch his church. And what is also amazing, this is how it ends. Never again in the book of Revelation, you will read the name the church. Because now the book is going to change. Because now the rapture is going to take place. Therefore, the calling of the Lord that we should prepare our hearts, that we should open our hearts, that he can come into his church so that he can take his church with the rapture away. So he's asking his church, I stand at the door and I knock. If you would only open up, I will come in and I will have fellowship with you. So, and ending, those who had ears to hear would hear what the Spirit was saying to the churches. Next time when we come together, there will be no church on earth anymore because we will move into Revelation chapter 4. Thank you. God bless you. Looking forward to talk to you about Revelation chapter 4. Next time we come together, we will look at the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.